Hey everyone, welcome to the fourth Pocket Now Pocket Cast. We are now on not only iTunes, but also Zune, so you can download the Pocket Cast in many different ways, and we're really excited about that. So on our call today, we've got my permanent co-pilot here, Evan Blass. Evan, say hi. Hey guys. Hey, Brandon. Hey, hey. And we've also got Tony, who just came in from Spain after being out at Mobile World Congress, which we're going to talk a lot about. Say hi, Tony. Hey guys. Hey, Brandon. Hey, Evan. And uh, let's, let's start there. Uh, Tony, general thoughts on Mobile World Congress. What did you think about it? Well, uh, it was a first for me, and uh, I can compare it only to the coverages which we had in the past, and saying that, I might say that it was quite a successful MVC. I've got plenty of thoughts on surprises, on um, letdowns, on success stories, but generally speaking, it was, it was a good show. Good to hear. So let's let's jump right into that. What was the biggest surprise of Mobile World Congress, Evan? Um, I thought the biggest surprise. Well, first of all, I should say, um, unfortunately, that there weren't that many surprises, and and you know where we as um, as bloggers and, and journalists were part of that because you know we basically sort of leaked everything beforehand, so <laughs> there weren't all that many. Um, I can't think of, of, of almost any products that, that we didn't know about ahead of time, um, except maybe the, um, the name of the Xperia Pro. So, so I would say the biggest surprise was um, the fact that we didn't see um, anything really high-end from HTC. I, I can talk about that a little bit more later, but we were really expecting to see um, the, the Pyramid or, or the HD2 or whatever it's going to be called, um, you know, their, their dual-core device that they have uh, in the pipeline. and. And the fact that we didn't see it, that was pretty surprising to me. Yeah, well, we're going to talk more about that indeed. Tony, biggest surprise of Mobile World Congress? Well, it's not the biggest surprise. As Evan said, we knew everything before the MVC. But um, let's not talk about devices for the next 10 seconds. For me, the biggest surprise was Stephen Ballmer's keynote and the announcements which uh, where he said that the features which will come to Windows Phone 7 will be pretty pretty good so for me the biggest surprise was Microsoft Keynote I gotta go with you on that Tony uh, I was not expecting there to be so so much information coming out of Microsoft in fact we were talking on the site about how um, you know where's Microsoft this year with the, with their with their hardware or any sort of announcements but you know he talked about the mango update with the IE9 integration and the new way of of multitasking with the uh, you know the press and hold of the back button to bring up like a card like view so I concur there uh, wasn't expecting that I don't think anyone was expecting so much information out of Microsoft what else was part of that announcement for mango so we have um, fast we have apps Twitter fast, integration with Twitter people integration hub. people hub uh, i9 i9 gaming improvements uh-huh and that was pretty much it yeah there's gonna be a time with connect apparently that that looks like it's gonna be kind of cool Mm-hmm. Yep, the tie-in with Connect. For me, though, um, I would love to go back to Windows Phone 7. Right now I'm on Android, but I can't do it because it still feels like an iPhone first generation having to go back to the home screen to change apps. It's it's just ridiculous. And the back button is so limited in its functionality to take you to a previous app. It's just it's messy. All right, so uh, next let's talk about the biggest winner of Mobile World Congress, whether it was a device or a company. Tony, what do you think was the biggest winner this year? Well, I think it was a company, and it's called LG. We heard about the uh, Optimus 2X and the Optimus Black with the occasion of CES, so it was really down to the Optimus 3D, and having a 3D, a Glasses 3 3D uh, smartphone on display was, was great. And on the same note, I should uh, say that there was also another 3D smartphone, which was the uh, Lynx 3D, which nobody seemed to mention. But taking that, uh, putting that aside, I think the biggest surprise, the winner surprise, was, uh, was LG. Let me, let me ask you a question about LG, Tony. Uh, how is their build quality? It's been a while since I played with an LG device. Well, I'm, uh, I'm using the Optimus 7 as my daily driver, and I've got some serious hands-ons with all the uh, LG devices on display at MVC, and I mm-hmm. think they're, they're coming up right on par with HTC. Really? Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, that's pretty impressive. I didn't... I wasn't under that impression. I thought that they were sort of just accelerating these products to market, forgetting Not about at all. build quality. 
Not at case. all. They, they, they are so solid. There are no squeaking sounds. The, the materials used are, are top-notch, so build quality is good. to hear, good to hear. And I have a biggest winner of Memorial Congress. Um, I think the the biggest well I don't know if you would you would say this was this was necessarily at Mobile World Congress but in, in the same time frame I thought Microsoft um, getting Nokia on board for them is just huge and um, so so um, if you consider that uh, Mobile World Congress then um, then Microsoft and, and Windows Phone Seven were definitely the big winners. Very good. Yeah, that's a, a, a huge win for both sides there. Um, for the biggest winner, I would have to say Sony Ericsson uh, came forth with a portfolio of Android phones, and it wasn't it wasn't that long ago when we were writing Sony Ericsson off as a player in Android when they had the Xperia X10, which was running old software. It was slow. Um, it took a long time to come to the U.S., and it finally seems that they're they're kicking up the the, the gears and uh, releasing new hardware. Hopefully, it'll actually land on carriers around here. But the play is coming. Uh, to Verizon relatively soon is 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 March the the time frame Evan or is it May? Mm, I think it's April. April. So okay. right in between there. Very good. Okay, next thing about Mobile World Congress biggest disappointment. Evan, start with you. Um, well, as usual, I thought not as usual, but you know, with, <laughs> with, with CES um, and, and now Mobile World Congress, this is two shows in a row that that HTC really hasn't uh, come through with any exciting hardware. Um, all we had in this show was um, two phones that you know we were really expecting, which was the uh, the Desire S and the uh, Incredible S, and you know nothing really exciting there. And then also the Wildfire S, which you know another mid-range handset, and then two other phones which which did give something different, but. But not different in a way that that I think most of our readers are are interested in, which was these these Facebook buttons, which, you know, for for a, a segment of the population and, and and for the market, I think that that they will um, they will have some um, you know th- they will have some popularity, but but for for people who want high end phones, HTC really didn't just didn't come through yet, and and like I said before, there there was no pyramid, there was nothing dual core. Nothing bigger than you know four inch screens or WVGA. I mean, it it just wasn't really that exciting. Yeah, I've got a I've got a side with you on that, and I was looking more into the salsa and the cha cha, which is of course HTC's Facebook phones. They kind of have a really interesting function with the Facebook button that's more than just taking you to the Facebook app. Uh, when you are in a screen where you can share something. Uh, some sort of content, whether it's a song or a website or a picture, the Facebook button actually glows. So then you know that this is something that you can share. It's kind of an interesting idea. I think it's kind of going to be a novelty for a lot of people. Um, but I agree with you, Evan. HTC uh, disappointed. Uh, we we were expecting, every year we expect from them something amazing. Last year we had the, the Desire HD and the Legend, which were the first sort of unibody phones with a new version of Sense that was truly different, and then they brought forth these, you know, point one upgrade phones with a slightly new version of Sense, and it was just, it, it was underwhelming. Tony, what do you think? Biggest disappointment? Well, I think I have to agree with you, and um, I think I'll have to agree with everybody saying that HTC was the biggest letdown, and not only because we've had the uh, remakes, the S series for the Incredible and Wildfire, which are pretty much the same internals in another box take or leave uh, the 8 megapixel camera and the uh, 1.3 megapixel front facing camera on the Incredible S but um, the biggest letdown inside HTC was uh, that they were not allowing us to have any hands on action with with the uh, Facebook phones they've had it on display but uh, they were closed in a glass box it was like uh, HTC got word that INQ is releasing the Facebook phone and they Mm -hmm. had to do something with it but um, I get the feeling that it was uh, unfinished hardware finished software and it's uh, it's the same with the flyer tablet which they had so as far as I'm concerned with no hands-on possibility no pricing no availability these devices are still a rumor for me <laughs> is that a capital R rumor or a lowercase R yeah for me? capital R capital R definitely <laughs> well uh, they're they're coming to the US the the salsa and the cha-cha 
I guess HTC and AT&T thinks that Americans are more Facebook obsessed than yeah, people in other countries. But um, Okay, let's move on. Finally, about Mobile World Congress, what phone do you guys want to buy that came out of Mobile World Congress? Let's start with Evan. Uh, well, I think I'm most looking forward to the, uh, the Optimus 3D, um, not only because it, it's supposed to be you know, smoking benchmarks so far, but just the fact that, that you can both record and play back um, 3D um, content on the same device, I think, is pretty intriguing. So, so just for the, the novelty alone, uh, I'm excited about that. But you know, even if that wasn't there, it's supposed to be a pretty, a pretty um, uh, smoking device. Yeah, Tony, tell us more about, before you answer the question, tell us about how realistic the 3D was on, well, on the Optimus. It, it really is. Uh, they had some uh, demo videos which were playing on, on the screen, uh, like I think I captured the one with the occasion of the hands-on with the parachuters jumping out of the airplane. It, right. It's it's really, really great. I mean, you have that cinematic 3D feeling when you look at, at the content. Uh, it's not the same when you record your own 3D video. I mean, uh, you can see that it's recorded with a smartphone camera. You have 3D alright, but it's not that standing out, jumping out of the screen 3D. But mm. if you have content which was professionally recorded and uh, synced to your device, it's fantastic. It just blows out. So so when you record the 3D from the phone with the dual lenses, it's not as captivating as the pre-existing content? It's somewhat right, yeah. It's it, it's somehow washed out like, like you're used to uh, recordings with your smartphone. Interesting. And it's so hard to imagine 3D on a smartphone. Is there anything else you can tell us about it that would make us understand what it's like? Mm, well, it's like when you sit in with the with the, your glasses at the cinema at IMAX and you see, let's take a video. Uh, no, let's take a game because they had also some games on display. You have that depth of field. You you can mm -hmm. see uh, you can see your enemies coming out from from around the corner even if they're far away which which you cannot really see on a 2d uh, 2d uh, display now, let me ask you this i saw a glasses free tv at ces and it was it was okay it was the technology is not there yet for a bigger display you have to stand exactly in one spot the resolution was very low uh did you have any of that sort of problem with the optimus 3d where if you yes. moved it so you have to look at it directly yes. head on. You have to be directly in front of it with a certain viewing angle, take or leave uh, a, a few uh, degrees in an uh, angle. But um, I've got something. I don't know if it's if it's the display or if it's my eyes because uh, about five or ten minutes after watching the three D content on the Optimus three D, my eyes hurt. Mm. So maybe it's the frequency or maybe it's my eyes. I don't know. But um, it was the same with the, with the Lynx 3D too, so I guess it's my eyes. Man, that really just proves that these, these phones with 3D aren't ready for prime time yet. I mean, when you shoot a 3D video or you're watching a 3D movie, you're going to want to share it with people. And if you can only have one or two people directly in the line of sight, I mean, it's, it's kind of silly. Yeah, but LG will tell you that you can hook it up via HDMI to your big screen 3D uh, TV and you can share it that way. So uh, they have an answer for that too. As far as I'm concerned, 3D on a smartphone is more like a, a gimmick. We, we're not there yet. So I don't think there will be a demand on the market except those uh, typical, excuse me, fanboys who will buy something just for the sake of it, just for the novelty. So you're saying that LG thinks that if you buy an LG TV as an accessory to their smartphone, they'll work in tandem just right. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> the same with their tablet. I mean, the tablet also records 3D content, but it cannot play back 3D content on its own screen. And uh, while you can play it back on the uh, Optimus 3D, you have another feeling when you play it back hooked to your 3D TV. Very good, very good. So, so Tony, which, which phone would you want to buy? Uh, obviously the Optimus 3D, so uh, Optimus 3D. yeah, it, it rocks both uh, display-wise because the display is also when you get out of the 3D content and you get into the typical Android interface, which is 2D, of course, it's it's vibrant, it has contrast, and of course it's it's kicking some real competition, but with the uh, Quadrant score. Right, right, right. Uh, I'm going to have to stray from the pack here. Um, I'm not impressed with really any of the phones. I'm looking at my little cheat sheet here, and I'd have to go with the Galaxy S2 um, because 
AMOLED, Super AMOLED at 4 inches is awesome on the Nexus S, on the Galaxy S. 4.3 inches Super AMOLED Plus, this thing might have the awesomest screen ever. Uh, it's going to be fast. It's going to be probably as thin as the Xperia Arc from Sony Ericsson. Thinner, so supposedly. Got like, e- even thinner, yeah. Thinner, thinner, yeah. So uh, uh, that's the phone that, that, that I'm... Uh, uh, root it, take off TouchWiz, put on stock Android, and you've got yourself a pretty good thing. Hey, Brandon, can you live with a device which is a feather lightweight? Because uh, the Galaxy S2, is, y- you can barely feel it in your hands. It's so thin and it's so lightweight that y- you're holding like two pieces of papers in your hand. Does it feel cheap, though? Um, no, it feels, I don't know how to explain this, like like you're holding something which should be heavier. Unsubstantial. Right, that's the word. Unsubstantial, hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point, because you would think that people would tend to want light phones, but the truth is that when you have a heavier phone, it feels more significant, more substantial. Um, Evan, wasn't the LG Expo extremely heavy? Yeah, I've had a couple phones that were really that were like that. The uh, Xperia X1 was the same way. You know, that thing was a little tank. Um, yeah. So uh, I personally don't mind to have, you know a phone that that weighs a little bit more. You know, especially if they're going to have some uh, some metal in it and some you know higher end um, components and materials. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, heavier to me means more complexity, and maybe that's just in my head. Like the uh, the the Inspire 4G, which I'm still using as a daily driver, it is it is heavy, uh, but it's al- it's also made out of metal and glass, and it's got a big screen. And I'm thinking how complex it must be inside to run all these components. And I don't know. I guess it's just uh, a matter of perception. Uh, so let's let's move on from Mobile World Congress. Over overall, we were we were relatively underwhelmed. CTIA is around the corner. Evan's going to be there. And hopefully we'll see something higher end from everyone, uh, especially HTC, with uh, with the pyramid that we've been we've been hearing about and talking about. And maybe we'll get some hands on with the Facebook phones. Maybe we'll finally get some hands on with the cha cha and salsa. So let's move on. So this week, uh, it happened several times. It even happened yesterday. Android 3.0 Honeycomb, or at least the emulator SDK version, the pre-release, was ported to the Droid Incredible, the Desire HD, the Evo 4G, and now the Nexus One. And the question here is, um, you know, once Honeycomb is released and it's all the source code is out there, it's going to be able to be ported to every Android phone that you can think of, as long as it's rooted. So people out there that have a rooted phone will have the opportunity to run the tablet version of Android on their phone. And the question uh, that I'm proposing is, um, is Honeycomb for tablets a good option for for phones? I think it has um, certain elements that are definitely um, conducive to, uh, to, to any size device, really. And... Um, I also I'm not sure that that the question is quite right. Um, the the people who are are putting this on are are you know the people who want the latest and greatest, you know the the stuff that's that's unreleased just coming out. Um, the same way that I used to to flash my uh, my Windows Mobile devices, you know, every couple days. Um, mm-hmm. It's just fun. I, I don't think that that people who are, are on the cutting edge necessarily. Um, are looking for their phones to have the same functionality as as stock builds or more um, more mature and more polished ROMs. So so people aren't necessarily using these to, to have the the most functional version of Honeycomb, but they you know they want to to try out some of the features and and for that I think it it's great. Good point. Good point. Uh, yeah, that's a. The, the question is, what should we be asking about Honeycomb on, on a smartphone? Tony, what are your, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, I'll start with a little bit of uh, off-topic introduction. Off-topic because uh, we obviously don't cover tablets, but uh, the geek in me wanted to have a hands-on with all the tablets uh, running Honeycomb at uh, MVC, so I'm at the Zoom, I'm at the uh, Galaxy Tab 10.1 and the Optimus Pad, and of course they all run Honeycomb. And... Uh, 
I don't see how anyone could use it successfully on a smartphone. I mean, it's so well designed for the tablet, and everybody was uh, was unhappy to uh, to find out that Google said, "Okay, 3.0 is tablet only." Believe me, it is. Just to give you a short, a quick example, the browser. They have implemented these tabs in the browser with a small X button for closing a single tab. You can tap it with your hand on a 10 inch tablet but you will not be able to do that on a smartphone and of course the home screen which is designed to landscape portrait which i'm sure it will look let's say uncool on a smartphone running a portrait in the, instead of landscape so um, my thoughts are that honeycomb is for tablets and should remain on tablets only yeah i think you hit the nail on the head tony i just an hour ago got Honeycomb to run on my Nexus One, and it's fun and interesting and kind of has that wow, you know, fun effect that Evan alluded to, but the truth is that the buttons are so small that I cannot use this without paying attention to where my, my finger is, and you know, even if you put this on a device like the Desire HD with a 4.3 inch display, it's still not going to be a good experience, right. and I'm just, I'm imagining myself walking down the street trying to use this web browser on this tiny little screen with the small X buttons. The, the, the point is that Honeycomb is made for, for bigger screens, and unless you have a 5 inch phone like the Dell Streak, um, or even maybe the Samsung Infuse with a 4.5 inch display, you're just not going to be able to use it as a phone because it's just not made for f small screens, period. Absolutely. Uh, that said, it is cool. The widgets are fun. I really haven't spent much time with it. We're going to put a video up of this probably uh, before people get to listen to the Pocket Cast. So um, that will be... That would be good. So... All right, so moving on. Um, last week, there were a lot of rumors about the next iPhone. And um, one of the rumors, which is still a valid rumor, it, it was that Apple's going to be j uh, bumping the screen size of the iPhone from 3.5 to 4 inches. Um, now, if you do the math, and I'm going to do the math again just to double check. Um, I've got this little Excel spreadsheet that lets me see... Uh, the PPI setting, or the PPI, because over, what's the value? 640. Over 300 PPI, you get to uh, a, a pixel density where the human eye cannot distinguish between pixels. That's why Apple called it the retina display. Now, now so, that's, that's what Apple's saying. I mean, there's, there's some controversy, quite a bit of controversy over that, over that I number. Mean, <laughs> okay, that's fair, but I mean, unless you have, like, like uh, the vision of a eagle of vision, blank. eagle vision. You're not going to be. I mean, can you see pixels on your screen, Evan? You have the iPhone four. No, but I'm saying you know it could be even lower than that. You know that that number was sort of something that was just thrown out there by Apple and 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 different people, different experts will tell you different things. Yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. So if they bump the screen size to four inches, their PPI drops from three thirty to. 288, thus rendering it, according to Apple, not a retina display. And so I have trouble uh, understanding how Apple could bump the size of their uh, of the iPhone 4 to 4 inches. I, I don't think it's really, really a problem of seeing the pixels. I mean, if you obviously can't see, according to Apple's logic, uh, 301 ppi pixels, you could obviously not see 299. So uh, the thing is that I think the Retina display and uh, all the fuss around it is just a uh, good marketing catch from Apple. And if they bump the screen size and the resolution, or the resolution will stay the same and the PPI will go down, they will come up with something like, I don't know, Iris display or whatever Iris to make the product Iris sell. Display. That's funny. That was a good one. It's like Retina 2.0. It's called the Iris display. Right. Yeah, I think it's good to note that Hitachi just started sampling these, um, these uh, what, 1280 by 720 screens that are, that are just 4 inches or, or maybe a little bigger, 4.3. So there are definitely, you know, higher resolution um, or higher pixel density screens than the, than the retina display, you know, just on the horizon. And, and if anyone is going to be first in line for something like that, it's definitely going to be Apple. 
Okay, guys, on, yeah. on a side note, a quick question. What do you think is the maximum resolution manufacturers would or should go up to on smartphones? They're going to go to 1080, I think, so, so people can watch their Blu-ray content. You know. I have 1080 on my 23-inch monitor. Can you imagine that on a 4.3-inch display? Oh, I know. That'd be insane. That would be ridiculous. So what, what uh, would be the sweet spot? I, I disagree with them going to a full 1920 by 1080 because there's just, uh, it's just, it seems that, I mean, eventually, okay, in the future when costs become super low, but um, I don't, th I think people will have the same experience watching a movie uh, in high definition on like a, a display capable of near 720p, let alone 1080p. I mean, my dad will tell you that he can't tell the difference between, you know, 480 and, and 720. So, you know, there's always going to be that, that contingent. But, but, you know, equally, there, there's always going to be people that want to that wanna max out their, uh, you know, their, their resolutions and their pixel densities. And, and they, even if it, if, it, if it visually doesn't make much of, a dif much of a difference, you know, just because, you know, they have the content at, at 1080, they want to be able to display it like that. This reminds me of uh, when I was younger, uh, and my, my brother Jared was the editor-in-chief of Pocket Now. Um, he would sometimes hand me down devices, and he would always hand me these devices, they're like the compact iPad, that had these QVGA displays, and I, <laughs> I hated those screens. They were so fuzzy and blurry, and for the longest time, we had QVGA smartphones, and then we hit like a wall, and then everything became... WVGA. We kind of skipped VGA, like the Dell Axum. Uh, I forget what the model was that had VGA, and then uh, I, I also the HTC Diamond. I think had VGA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the it's HTC a good Diamond, the, the the Touch Pro. Uh, they so they had like a generation of VGA, and then everything for the last like two or three years has been WVGA, and we're finally getting out of that, and we're going to get QHD. Um, so it's just just funny how how screen resolutions kind of kind of trend and then there's a tipping point where we see another jump to, to, to higher. Sort of the same thing with processors too where you have a couple generations of you know the one gigahertz Snapdragon and then before that we had that that awful uh, that 524 megahertz. 28. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching an unboxing that we did a long time ago of the uh, Touch HD and uh, it was billed as a potential iPhone killer and it had that processor you just talked about, the 528 megahertz processor, and then it had like 288 megabytes of RAM. Um, just fun, fun to look back. Okay, so moving on, another piece of news coming out of uh, the, the, the Apple side of things is that there isn't going to be an iPhone Nano. It's just going to get less expensive. And, you know... Apple does a lot of interesting things with price. They try to make things accessible, yet they put the, uh, the ceiling pretty high for people that want the top of the line. Um, so the question I want to propose to you two is, what is the sweet spot of pricing for the iPhone 5? Remembering that you know the original iPhone came out of the gate at like 500 bucks, and you had to buy it at that price. It wasn't subsidized. And then I think with the the 3G, the second generation iPhone, they started to subsidize the price. I think it was 299 Not exactly sure. And then the 3GS and the 4 came in at 199 So what's what's the sweet spot for the iPhone 5? I feel like uh, Inspire has really started to push things down at just $99. So I think I think we might see the uh, the iPhone 5 come in at, at 150 and 250 for for whatever the two... Um, capacity configurations are 150 and 250 so still stay above that $100 magical number yeah like you said you know Apple still wants to to be a, a premium product and and they can certainly afford to be but you know they also want to get their their products into the, the hands of as many people as possible and so you know you have to compete on price to do that and so it totally makes sense to have another iPhone you know, and, and they're sort of doing that now by, by keeping the last generation around and just making it cheaper. Yep. So it's not entirely clear what, uh, what they're going to be doing differently if they're, they're going to have something 
that um, is is a dedicated product that that comes out. You know the the iPhone 5 Mini or you know iPhone 5 Nano or whatever it's going to be. So if they do the iPhone 5 at 150 slash 250, you know they're going to keep the iPhone 4 around for like 49 bucks, and people are going to go wild over that. Yeah, it's a great phone. <laughs> they should. It is a great phone, Tony. What do you think the sweet spot is in pricing? Uh, well, uh, I agree with Evan uh, with the with his uh, sweet spot on the pricing. Um, I'd say that somewhere in time, maybe Apple will be forced to bring the price as low as ninety nine. Because uh, let's remember one of the uh, main principles of the Nokia Microsoft Strategic Alliance is to bring lower cost, lower budget phones, Windows phones to the market. And once Nokia starts shipping out these cheap Windows Phone 7s with great great build quality and hopefully Microsoft will be able to add features to, to the operating system by then, I think that competition will somehow force Apple to, to lower the price even more. I think that Absolutely. that's probably going to be a couple years out though. I mean, Microsoft has, has quite a bit of catching up to do on the software side of things. Absolutely. Do you guys think we're going to a future where, at least in the U.S., where phones are heavily subsidized, we'll, we'll have hot new phones free on contract? Well, I mean, we do now in, in some cases through, um, through you know, third-party re- retailers like, like Wirefly like and Let's right. Talk and whatever. Um, yeah, I think it, that'll eventually be the case through the carriers, but I think you know data plans are also going to get more expensive to to yeah. balance that out. They'll they'll keep tacking on uh, additional fees for the four G network and the five G network, and it'll just yeah. I mean, it's in the end you're probably paying around the same. Your cost is just spread yep. differently. Installments. Yep, and installments, and you know, uh, people in America seem to really like the idea of paying something monthly for a lower fee than having a larger upfront cost, which is why the subsidy model is so prevalent in the U.S. and it's not in Europe. I, that's, that's why we spend so much on credit cards, too. Yeah, that's right. All right, so let's move on uh, from the iPhone. We are talking now about LTE uh, voice technology, which they're calling V-O-L-T-E. Um, I don't know if you're supposed to say Volti or Volt. Volti. I, th- I think it's Volti. Volti. Um, it's interesting that we're finally, in 2011, talking about voice quality. Because I remember when I got my first cell phone and I was 16, I was appalled at the voice quality. The voice quality was far inferior to a landline. And, you know, a naive me didn't understand why that was the case. But it's possible... We're very likely that in in a year or two, we're going to have phones that use this Volti service that allow us to have so much more higher fidelity audio. Um, And, you know, AT&T is is talking about a 2013 launch uh, for their their phones with Volti, whereas Verizon's going to do it as early as this year and into next year. And, uh, you know, a year is kind of a long time in in the smartphone industry, so uh, is it too late for AT&T to launch it in 2013? Should they try to accelerate their, uh, their rollout of this? Well, uh, I don't think it will be too late because it's it's a new technology and uh, sometimes being a bit late to, to the show can be to your advantage. I mean, if, um, if AT&T will be bringing in Volti in 2013, they will see at least one year of feedback from the market uh, uh, from the Verizon point of view. And if um, if the product, the service is not selling that well, and it's not a um, big part of the market share, then uh, they might even cancel it. What do you think, Evan? Um, yeah, I have to agree with Tony here. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily going to be um, going to be you know killer for them. You know, AT and T has um, they built up quite a stockpile of, of customers by through their um, iPhone exclusivity over the last couple of years. So, uh, and, and as we've seen, you know, they'll, they'll do what it takes in marketing to, uh, to close that gap um, in, in technology, you know, by, by following T-Mobile with their whole, you know, 4G. That's, that's not really 4G, but it is. <laughs> and um, so, so I think that um, they, they'll probably, you know, 
play down um, the voice quality on Verizon and, and start, you know, playing up their own voice quality as well, you know, even though we, we don't have Volte yet or, or whatever it's called. I haven't actually ever heard it pronounced out loud either. Um, even though we don't have this yet, you know, nine out of ten customers say we have the best voice quality and they'll, they'll roll out right. all sorts of you know, funded, um, surveys that say that. So yeah, I don't, someone's got to be first. And, and, and in this industry, you know, Sprint had a, had a, a year or so head start with WiMAX and, uh, you know, they're not, they're not eating everyone else's lunch. So I don't think it's going to be a huge, um, it, it's going to be a, a big negative for at and It's, it's so funny. Uh, that you mentioned about uh, Sprint's launch of 4G first, and Verizon is here now in 2011, advertising that their network is the the most advanced 4G network. I was reading a billboard as I was driving uh, through Philadelphia, and I saw that billboard, and I I thought, why would people care if the network was advanced? Doesn't that mean complexity means difficult to understand means unreliable? I just I was. Uh, curious by the, the the choice of words, um, but this this Volte thing is a really big deal. Uh, a few months ago, some site posted a sample of what they called HD voice in the UK over Orange. The quality was comparable to the bump in quality you get from a, a, a landline phone call to Skype. When you Skype somebody, the quality is so much better. You can hear the crispness in their voice the boominess, and everything in between. And, and it's going to be the same way with, uh, with Volti. It's, it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be a game changer. Absolutely, and it's uh, funny you should mention that because I was just playing with my thoughts and uh, uh, with Volti, there will come an, an increase of uh, call quality. I think manufacturers will have to follow with hardware. I mean, you have to have some high-quality microphones and speakers built into Volte compatible devices because um, I don't think that speakers and microphones in uh, current devices have evolved that much over the past four, five, six years. I mean, everybody goes with the default. I don't know what's uh, the frequency range of those microphones, but uh, having a high-quality voice on a new network implies new hardware components and that will be a bump in price tags that, that's a really good point something that I never really thought about with with Volte we'll see a bump in finally speakerphone quality these tinny stupidly distorting speakers perhaps will become a thing of the past and hopefully uh, as you imply the costs won't increase that much for handsets so that'll be uh, something to, to keep an eye on um, all right, let's move on here. We are talking about now Ice Cream Sandwich, which is the next version of Android for phones, uh, will combine honeycomb and gingerbread. And, you know, I feel like we've been talking about the next version of Android for phones um, since they talked about honeycomb, and we haven't gotten any more clarity on what the heck it's going to be. Uh, it's going to bring some features of Honeycomb. Okay, yeah, which? It's going to be kind of like gingerbread. Okay, so what changes? Um, I feel like it's going to be, you know, mostly gingerbread features with, with um, a few added things for um, for multi-core processors and, and probably a UI overhaul. That's, that's what I'm getting out of it. Maybe the, uh, they're calling the... What's, what's the name of the interface in Honeycomb? It's called... Mm. Hol isn't the holographic or holog something like that? Something like that. Well, I think I think they will bring some interesting things from from Honeycomb to to Gingerbread and not vice versa. I mean, the stacks they look great, regardless if you're talking about your uh, stacks of photos, your stacks of YouTube videos, your stacks of uh, digital documents. Also, I think a good addition to Gingerbread will be the new mail application, which has uh, a fantastic way of displaying your emails, both in portrait and landscape. I don't think they will bring the uh, the browser. I mean, they might bring the browser in its tabbed version, but they will do some modifications to adapt it to smaller screens. But I think I think with the speed of Gingerbread and some of the features from Honeycomb, maybe even the, the media player, uh, they might pull this one off. Good point about the, uh, the the mail application, especially. 
it's kind of ridiculous that in stock Android, um, when you are in the mail application, the only way you can make a new message is by hitting the menu button and then compose. Uh, HTC got it right in the Sense version of Android, where there's a big fat compose button at the top of your mm -hmm. email screen. And I think what uh, Google has been very clear on is that the next version of Android for phones is going to bring forth these functions more, which begs the question, how are they going to fit it on a small screen? Um, you know, just, just like the browser where they can, if they want to, have tabs along the top. But there's really no space for that on a, on a, on a small screen unless you're using it in landscape. So, Well, uh, on, a, on a tablet, if you are using the mail application in landscape mode, you have this split view of your list of messages on the left and the actual message preview on the right. If you swipe to the left, you can take the uh, message list out of the screen and only uh, have the email body itself. Maybe they might uh, bring this one to gingerbread, like uh, you have, you're presented with your message list on the f mm -hmm. uh, while entering the application. Swipe to the left to have the preview of the of the email itself, and then swipe back to to your message list again. So there are possibilities. But I feel like the the preview scenario only works when you can see your message list at all times. Yeah. Right. Hmm. That will be interesting to see indeed. Either way, ice cream this summer. Be there. Mm. We'll be there. We All will right. definitely be there during the summer. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Uh, a Dell roadmap leak that looks very um, accurate or believable from WP Central. Uh, and what we have here is, th or, yeah, three devices. Um, now, Dell is relatively new to smartphones. Of course, they had the Streak, which was the 5-inch kind of tablet pseudo-smartphone. Then they had the Aero, which is a low-end, mid-range smartphone that no one really cared about. And then they did the Venue Pro, which I know Tony is a huge fan of, and I am too. Uh, and then they did the Venue without the Pro, which is an Android phone. Um, I had the opportunity to, to review both the Venue Pro and the Venue, and the I was mega impressed. I mean, Dell's build quality, uh, I think rivals or even exceeds HTC. The phones just had tremendous quality to detail. Uh, everything from the texture on the back to the curve, curvature of the glass on the front to the speed of the operating system to the touch sensitivity, it was just, it was right on. And so we've got these three devices. We've got the Wrigley, which is a Windows Phone 7 device with a single core one gigahertz processor. It basically is a refresh of the Venue Pro. Um, perhaps coming around in time for Mango. And the, the roadmap has it piv uh, pointed at July, August time frame. And then there's the Hancock. We start getting into some interesting form factors. Slide down keyboard, running Android ice cream, dual core processor, four inch QHD display. This thing's gonna be a tank. I mean, what, what slide down keyboard phone do you know of that has a bigger screen than four inches? I mean, most of them come in at about 3.6, 3.7. This thing's going to be huge. What's the um, the Epic 4G? That is, okay, that is four inches. That's the, uh, that's the only other one I can think of, too. And so, you know, it's, it's going to be a substantial phone. And then we've got perhaps uh, a twist on the Hancock. You take the Hancock and you add a bigger screen, so 4.3 inches, still has the dual core processor, still runs ice cream. Um, so it's, it's basically a, uh, they're kind of the same device, just one is a bigger screen. So my question to you guys is, is Dell on the right track to be able to compete with Samsung and HTC? <laughs> now, excuse me for being a jerk, because I will be a jerk in the upcoming minutes. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the Dell Venue Pro, and uh, here we are four months after Windows Phone 7 was launched, and there are no Venue Pros in Europe. I mean, you've got some yeah. Venue Pros in the USA, but uh, uh, you've been following the news, and I hope our listeners have been following the news, that the Dell Venue Pro is delayed and delayed and delayed again in Europe. I mean, how on earth would Dell pull this off when they are not able to, to launch a device, a single device, in four months time frame? So, excuse me. Well, and, and jerk mode, so. And jerk mode. Well, well there was a flaw, I believe. There were, the Venue Pros were crashing or something. Do you remember that? Well, there, there was a couple flaws. 
It wasn't just one. They had that. Some of them, the Wi-Fi wouldn't work. Yeah, it was yeah. the Wi-Fi. Then, uh, then it was some uh, unnamed reason. Then it was some Microsoft MMS settings, and then again something else that wasn't named. I think it got delayed four or five times now. And the fact is that it's four months past the Windows Phone Seven launch date, and there's still no Dell Venue Pro in Europe. I mean, you can't buy it. That's ridiculous. Well, Tony, I gotta tell you, it's a good phone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh -huh. I mean, I mean, see, I, Adam has one too, <clears throat> and uh, we all do. If you get a, you. <laughs> yeah, we we have all got three of them actually. You want one? I'm just kidding. Uh, no, it's a. If you get a good one, it's a really, really good phone, and it's unfortunate that they're being delayed in Europe, and it probably is going to impact the excitement for these future devices from Europeans because if they can't deliver on a device that should have been out four or five months ago, you know, these next wave of devices may not. Be that yeah, and I really think the uh, the winner here is HTC. I mean, uh, HTC 7 Pro started selling uh, one, one and a half weeks ago, and the uh, people who were actually waiting for the Alvenue Pro are starting to buy the uh, 7 Pro. Everybody said, I'm not waiting anymore. I've been waiting for four months. So uh, I think they should get this thing straight first get all the pieces together, they'll make the, the, the big picture, the image, and then go on and make some new phones. Yep. I agree. Speaking of the 7 Pro, we will have a full review uh, coming up early this week, so look out for that. It's not really out yet. It's coming to Sprint. Um, it's available in limited capacity in Europe, but we got one, and we're going to have the full review coming up soon or coming up soon as i like to <laughs> tell evan <laughs> um all right so just got a couple more things to talk about quickly here as we approach the 60 minute mark that we try to keep these pocket casts to uh this week we've got two big phone releases two highly anticipated phone releases we've got the atrix 4g on the the date keeps changing but i think it's the 22nd right. now which is actually tuesday and then we've got the Thunderbolt tomorrow, or actually today's Monday. Wow, I thought it was Sunday. Uh, today, in 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 uh, at least for the pre-order, I believe, or are they take are they sending them out today? I think it's only the pre-orders. Yeah, I think the twenty eighth yeah. is when they're uh, actually shipping and going on sale. Yeah. So you know. Which one of these phones do you think is the going to be the biggest topic of conversation in the geeky corners of the world, or at least the United States, since that's where they're shipping? Well, I think definitely Atrix. I mean, besides the fact that that you've got faster data on um, on Thunderbolt, you know, there's there's nothing really new there in terms of the hardware. While while Atrix has got a ton of stuff that we haven't seen before, so. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, it's a no-brainer, you know, Moto all the way. Yeah, I, I agree with right. Evan. Uh, uh, Verizon was at the Mobile World Congress, and uh, so was Motorola, and I had hands-on with both the Atrix and the Thunderbolt. And the Thunderbolt is really just your typical HTC device with some added-on radio for higher speeds. But what will really sell the Atrix is the performance and that fantastic idea they got with, with the dock. I mean, you take the device in your pocket, your mobile, you go to your office, you hook it up to your netbook-like uh, add-on dock, and uh, there you can uh, continue working. Then you go home, you hook it up to your multimedia dock, and then you can enjoy your pictures and content. Now, regardless of what else AT&T will be, uh, let's say, demanding for, for extra internet, I think the Atrix 4G will generate a lot of buzz. All right, I'm going to go against the grain here. Um, I'm excited about the uh, the Thunderbolt because you take the Inspire 4G, you add a much larger battery. Thunderbolt has a 1,900 milliamp hour battery. That is huge. Uh, you add a front-facing camera. You add 4G LTE. You know, the, uh, the Atrix 4G and the Inspire 4G both have... HSBA Plus support, but they don't have they don't have HSUPA. Um, as we found out recently, there's an article on Android Central 
Which means that if you're not in an area with AT&T's HSBA Plus, and we don't know where that is, it's not around here, because I'm not getting HSBA Plus, you're going to have speeds that are slower than what you would get over a, with a standard 3G phone. So either your speeds are crappy or they're great, and it's impossible to know when they will be great because AT&T isn't mentioning anything about when this uh, 4G network is going to be really out there and you can hear it in my voice I'm very bitter about it still mm. because you know you've got this uh, you've got the 4G capability on these phones and you just don't get 4G speeds it's really a uh, really a shame yeah but that's an issue the uh, operator has to to solve themselves it's not the issue with the device fair but I, I think what I'm trying how I'm trying to frame this is you know if I, if I were looking for a new smartphone I was thinking go on Verizon with the Thunderbolt go on AT&T with the Atrix I would probably side with the Thunderbolt. Really? Yeah. So the data is that important to you that you would give up the, the screen resolution and, and the dual core and the laptop dock? And the huge and... RAM. Yeah, I don't think that stuff matters. Uh, the, the dual core and the huge RAM and the laptop You heard it dock. here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, the... Uh, Another con of the Atrix 4G is that it's running MotoBlur. Uh, Sense, the new version of Sense, is far superior to the previous versions of Sense, which was slow, full of eye candy, and just a headache to use. Um, you know, the last Sense phone I used, I was I was really trying to find a way to turn off Sense, and you couldn't. But on the Inspire 4G, I leave it on because it's such a powerful device. It's so well tuned. Um, that the sense enhancements all work the way they were intended. Everything is instantaneous on this phone, and the Thunderbolt is pretty much the same phone, just a little bit better. You can, but uh, it, you, it's not so easy to root it and then put on a it's, sense. On it's Thunderbolt. already rooted, by the way. I think the Atrix 4G got rooted. Right, right. But, but I mean, there's no ROMs for yeah. it that I've seen that have Absolutely. sense. So that's, that's still, uh, still not quite here yet. So you guys have fun with your HRCs, and, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll be loading web pages faster with the Thunderbolt. And uh, <laughs> We have Wi-Fi in our houses, <laughs> so we'll be okay. Well, I'm going to disconnect the router. That's not nice. All right, so uh, I think that's pretty much all we wanted to talk about this week. Uh, a lot of news out of Mobile World Congress, a lot of stuff with the iPhones and the new, new Dell roadmap, and we've got two big phone releases this week. That was really uh, that was really what we had to talk about today. So thanks everyone for listening. Again, we are on iTunes and Zoom now, um, but if you're listening to this, you must have figure that out already. Uh, so thanks again for listening. Thanks, Tony and Evan, uh, once Thank again. Thank you. Thanks, and Brian. And we'll, uh, we'll see everyone next time. That's it for now.